right, welcome to the Young Turks. I am your host, Cenk Uger. We got an awesome show ahead for you guys. Uh, both Latinos and African Americans uh, react to President Obama. Uh, and it is a fascinating reaction. Uh, President Obama reacts to uh, the budget situation. He's apparently going to unveil a fresh new plan. That's, uh, substantively speaking, the story of the day. We're going to get to that in a little bit. We'll tell you what's in the fresh new plan. And um, furthermore, uh, we are going to start out with some fun uh, for you guys. Mitt Romney and Michelle Bachman. So let's get to it. Okay. So Mitt Romney is going to take on President Obama uh, saying, hey, you know what? You got to get to work, man. I can't have you hanging out in fancy places. Let's let him rip the president here. The president this week is in uh, three states on a bus tour campaigning. Uh, and then he's going to be going on a vacation to Martha's Vineyard for 10 days. A lot of Democrats in Martha's Vineyard. I don't know why. But uh, <laughs> um, I, I wish the president... We're in Washington calling back Congress and, and dealing with the challenges we have. I don't know that he has a strategy now or whether he, he basically thrown up his hands and, uh, and is just hoping things will get better. You know what? Zinger got him. What's he doing at Martha's Vineyard? Well, I'll tell you what. Mitt Romney, he's going to be at a place when he, uh, Obama's in Martha's Vineyard that is totally different, right? And he's going to show how blue collar he is and how he's rolling up his sleeves and going to work. So you want to guess where Mitt Romney is on that day? Martha's Vineyard. Uh, you can't make this stuff up, okay? I, no, not somewhere else that's fancy. Not Beverly Hills, not somewhere else. No, Martha's Vineyard. He goes and does a speech where he's like, can you believe this? Some of my bitches going to Martha's Vineyard. Hell, where are you going? Well, obviously Martha's Vineyard. I guess he's surprised the Democrats show up there. He's like, oh, look at that. That's supposed to be for rich Republicans. Please, why is he there? By the way, why is Romney there? Is he there to roll up his sleeves to help the American people? No. He's going for a $2,500 plate fundraiser, okay, with incredibly rich people who live on Martha's Vineyard, who are Republicans, by the way. And uh, finally, uh, he actually does not have to spend that much time in Martha's Vineyard. Uh, he only goes in there for fundraisers because he owns a $10 million lakeside house in nearby New Hampshire. So, it must be nice being a rich Republican and then making fun of Democrats for going to Martha's Vineyard. Now, by the way, if you want to know my opinion on Obama going to Martha's Vineyard, I think it's a terrible idea. And I'm speaking strictly from a political point of view here. Now, policy-wise, it doesn't matter where the hell he goes. He can go to Compton, he can go to Martha's Vineyard. That's, it's, it doesn't affect his policies, right? But if I'm the president, man, and the economy is slumping, I mean, look, you're from the, your home state is Hawaii, right? So everybody gets that you're going to vacation in Hawaii. So there's no problem, man. But Martha's Vineyard is a terrible place to go politically. He's just incredibly lucky that all of his opponents are just as, you know, needy of, I guess, incredibly rich people as he is, right? And by the way, you know, I've now seen 108 articles about how Rick Perry has these huge problems because he's raising money from questionable people, right? Uh, literally, there's so many articles, I, I can't even bring them all to you, right? Not even close. I'm bringing you about a, a third of them, and I feel like I'm boring you with all the same thing about how Rick Perry takes questionable money from lobbyists, right? He, in fact, one of the articles today in Politico is he ran a commercial against Kay Bailey Hutchinson for taking money from this certain lobbyist in Texas, and now he's taking money from the same exact guy and from former dictators that that guy represents, right? So it's endless, right? But you know what? You think Rick Perry's gonna get hurt by that? As I was reading the article, and they were like, oh, this might cause him political trouble. I, I'm like, I don't think so, because who's gonna criticize him? Mitt Romney takes just more money in, from lobbyists and questionable lobbyists than Rick Perry does. So is Romney gonna go after Perry? Is Michelle Bachman? She takes all the money too. They all take the money. Who's gonna go after them? Obama, who's gonna raise a billion dollars from lobbyists? Well, and, and other people, <laughs> mainly, of course, lobbyists. So no, they're all, you're never going to find out about it unless you watch the Young Turks and a couple other shows because everybody's in on the game and they're not going to criticize each other because they all know they're all guilty. So that's the real racket. So, but of course, leave it to the, by the way, and I should point out, there, there's an important exemption here that you just saw with your own eyes. Republicans will criticize Democrats for it, even though they're doing the same exact thing on the same exact day at the same exact place. Okay, because they've got... Because he has a lot of chutzpah. Right? 
<laughs> but the Democrats won't criticize the Republicans because they're Democrats, and the Republicans won't criticize each other because they know that that's, you know, that they'll be going nuclear and they all have mutually assured destruction on that. All right, now, speaking of Bachman, let's go to her. Now, I have issued a challenge to Michelle Bachman before. I'm going to double down on it now. Uh, she's a welfare queen of the highest order. Uh, her uh, family farm takes federal farm subsidies for the American people, and she has not returned any of that money. In fact, she's making a lot of money off of it. Now, Michelle Bachman claims that that's not true. Let me give you a quote that she said. She said, the farm, uh, referring to the family farm that they have, is my father's in, uh, father-in-law's farm. It's not my husband and my farm. My husband and I have never gotten a penny of money from the farm. Here's the only problem with that. It is 100% certifiable lie. Now, that's a strong statement. How do I know? Well, I looked at Michelle Bachman's tax records. It's the taxes that she filed. And remember, she's a tax attorney. So it's not like, oh, golly gee, willikers, I didn't know what was happening with my taxes. Okay? So what, what did she say in her taxes in 2009? Made money off the farm. 2010? Made money off the farm. Not her, the father-in-law. Her and her husband made money off the farm. In fact, since 2006, they have made between $37,504 and $120,000 in income from that farm that takes federal farm subsidies. Okay? Uh, and how much is the farm worth? Well, we know because, again, it's in her own tax forms. They estimate that the farm is worth between $500,000 and $1 million, okay? So, now, I give you that number so you have a sense of the scope. So how much farm subsidies did they take? Well, before 2001, when her and her husband were not making money off of it, it was just the father-in-laws, he'd already taken $250,000 in subsidies. Now, the farm, as you see, is only worth at most a million dollars. That's a lot of subsidies to take, right? And that helped to build up the farm that Michelle Bachman now profits off of. But it's not just that. Since 2001, since Michelle Bachman has been profiting from this farm, it has taken an additional $150,000 from the American taxpayers in subsidies. So I issue another challenge to Michelle Bachman. Give our money back, you welfare queen. Because apparently the first time I told you... You didn't hear me. Okay, and you need to hear it loud and clear. Okay, that is $154,000 that you sucked out of the system for your own benefit and put into your pocket. What happened? I thought you were a social conservative. I thought you were a fiscal conservative. Give the money back to the American people. Look, we're going to come after you, uh, whether it's on YouTube, Facebook... Or on Twitter, and you know, as Rick Perry says. And you can always follow me on Twitter. So you can find out where we're coming for you from there, Michelle Bachman. Give the money back, you hypocrite welfare queen. Okay, I think I've been very clear on that. Um, so now we move forward. Uh, hey, look, there's victories. In Wisconsin, uh, we, yesterday we had the two Democrats running uh, off against two Republicans in uh, two more recall elections. Now, remember, one uh, Democrat had already uh, faced a recall election and won easily, and then the six Republicans went. Two of them lost. And now uh, Senator Bob Wirch has defeated uh, Jonathan Stites. The Republican and State Senator Jim Halp uh, Halperin has also defeated uh, Tea Party activist Kim uh, Simak in, in the 12th District. So um, they withstood those challenges. Uh, the reason, part of the reason I'm telling you this story is because it's important. The other reason is I, I think that the media, and I think a lot of progressives, honestly, are totally screwing up this story. Um, everybody's painting it as the Democrats lost because they didn't get enough seats to flip the legislators, uh, legislature in Wisconsin so that to stop um, the plans of, of the governor, of course, right? And by the way, you should know Governor Scott Walker won those districts uh, in his own election. So those are not heavily Democratic districts. They were tight races uh, in the past, and then the Democrats won fairly easily yesterday. Okay? So look, what's the final tally of Wisconsin? It's two to nothing. The Democrats flipped two from Republican to Democrat. Hanky Panky Kapanky and Hanky Panky Hopper both lost. So in the end, who won? Well, if it's two nothing, the Democrats won. There's no question that they won. So I don't want to see progressives saying, oh, we, we didn't achieve our objective or, no, I get it. Look, you know, the, they would have liked to have one more. 
and they would have liked to have flipped the legislature, like I said. But they still won. Every single article I've seen paints it as if the Democrats lost when they picked up two seats. Look, I, I care more about that than almost anything coming out of Washington, because it's actually a great sign that when people get mad, there are actual real results. And look, man, we, got, we picked up two seats that we normally didn't have, and now the, his margin for Governor Walker is razor thin in Wisconsin. One of those Republicans have voted with Democrats in the past, and if they see Republicans losing their seats, that's gonna scare them, because that's real. You hit them where it counts. Don't get discouraged by that at all. You should be wildly encouraged by that. Would I have liked more? Absolutely. But unlike what the mainstream media paints us as, we're not unreasonable, un non-pragmatic people. We're like, oh, we want everything. No, that was a great win. All right. Now, speaking of which, let's turn to President Obama. <laughs> let him know what's going on. Well, actually, he's going to try to let us know what's going on, but uh, it's not good. So. President Obama, uh, apparently uh, in the beginning of the fall, is going to announce a new, fresh plan for the budget. Now, it's apparently to create jobs, also to rein in the deficit. Okay, so in fact, let me let the Associated Press describe it for you. Uh, they say that uh, his new plan will be spurring new hiring, possibly through more tax cuts and infrastructure spending. Okay, what does that mean? I'm going to put on uh, the decoder ring for you and uh, and uh, describe it. Uh, by the way, it's actually the Washington Post, not the Associated Press. So um, what that means is uh, we uh, are going to do some infrastructure spending, but mainly we're going to focus on tax cuts. So what did I tell you before? That new package that they're going to put together, it's not going to be tax increases, it's going to be tax cuts, right? Second part of what the Washington Post explains. It's likely to include proposals for an overhaul of the tax code and entitlements. Here's what that means. That means they're gonna cut Social Security and Medicare. That is the reform of entitlements that they're talking about. And overhauling the tax code means taking out a couple of loopholes and dramatically lowering the rates for the top income bracket and corporations. So look, I keep telling you this. I, I hope I'm not boring you with it because the rest of the media is telling you something completely different. And you can judge for yourself when it happens, who's gonna be right, okay? You watch. I'm the only one telling you that they're gonna cut taxes. But I'm not making it up. I'm reading it right here based on leaks from inside the White House. They're gonna cut taxes for the rich, again. And then he's gonna come and tell us how progressive he is. All right, so here's point number three from the article. The president's debt proposal will be modeled on a $4 trillion plan to reduce the debt uh, that Obama introduced in April uh, and a grand bargain that he and Boehner came close to striking, et cetera. So what's the new part of this? <laughs> that's, the, that's the old plan. How many times have I told you they're gonna do the grand bargain and they're gonna cut, they're not gonna cut one and a half trillion. They already cut a trillion, so that what they're gonna do is they're gonna add at least three trillion in cuts to that. And it's gonna be, again, t closing some loopholes, cutting Social Security, Medicare, et cetera, cutting extra spending, not cutting defense very much, but mainly cutting taxes for the rich. You think Obama ever wavered from that? The reason he's so mad at the Tea Party, and right now he's giving speeches about the Tea Party and how they're screwing up the process. I'm gonna get to that in a second. You know, the reason he's so mad is like, you idiots, we already have a deal sponsored by Wall Street. The Democrats agree and the Republicans agree. Will you Tea Party people leave us alone? There's something wonderfully ironic about what's going on with the Tea Party. They're throwing a monkey wrench into the process by actually being more right-wing than Wall Street. But Wall Street's saying, no, 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 we don't need to go that far. And we don't care about your ideas and your right-wing proposals and conservative proposals. All we want, this is all an enormous subterfuge to make sure that we put the liability on the middle class, make them pay the bill, and make sure we get those corporate tax cuts and tax cuts for the rich. Tea Party, stop screwing it up. That's why Obama's mad. That's why the establishment Republicans are mad. But don't worry, the fix is in. Fred Upton is another one, one of the Republicans that was put on the committee where Boehner was like, uh, Boehner put him on and people were like, hey, why'd you put Upton on there? He's not necessarily diehard conservative, which is not true, by the way. As I told you, Fred Upton's taken a tremendous amount of money from Coke Industries and has changed a lot of his earlier so-called moderate positions. But people are asking questions, you know why? And Fred Upton recently said, hey, no, 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 we're gonna have to look at tax loopholes, et cetera. And then the, Republican, uh, the Tea Party guys were upset. 
No, because Fred Upton knows the deal. The deal is the grand bargain. That's what they're going to do. The Republicans on that committee and most of the Democrats on that committee are going to strike that grand bargain. How clear is it? If you read the actual reports, now turn on your television set, see if anybody's saying it. Anybody. Anybody. Okay? They all will pose it as a great drama and question and soap opera. I wonder what's going to happen. We don't know. Every single article I read, where, you know, where they go with the conventional wisdom, they just repeat it without thinking at all. Oh, there could be huge defense cuts. And everybody's concerned about the defense cuts that would automatically get triggered in. Who are you kidding, man? Those defense cuts are going to be a joke. I'm going to talk about that more a little bit later in the program. All right, let's continue with the article because I love decoding things for you guys. Here's another one to decode. Again, Washington Post. Obama urged the overhaul of patent laws and the passage of three trade bills, moves that congressional leaders have said they are preparing to make. These measures are likely to help employment only over the long term. You know what that means? That means they're not likely to help employment at all. They know that it isn't going to help employment by the 2012 elections because it doesn't help employment. It helps corporations outsource jobs. You know, and it, look, in the long run, you, you could have a real good debate as to whether they're good for the country or bad for the country. But they're not for job creation. As I've told you before, the one with Panama, the free trade deal, is simply so that corporations could hide more of their money. There's no other excuse for it. Hide more of their money in safe havens in Panama banks. So... They know it's not going to create jobs. That's why they give you the code words for uh, the, These measures are like to help employment over the long term. Don't expect any jobs while we pretend that this is about jobs. Okay, now uh, we go to President Obama and what he's saying about the deal and Tea Party, etc. Washington Post characterizes the first part. They summarize it as this. Obama said that he hopes his Republican adversaries in Congress hear from their constituents about the need for Congress to compromise with the White House on new proposals. Yeah, good luck with that. So his big strategy is go around Iowa, Illinois, Minnesota, and say, yeah, I hope you're hearing from your constituents that you need to compromise with us. First of all, that's not hearing what the Republicans are hearing from their constituents at all. They're hearing, <laughs> okay, and so I don't know, really Republican constituents are telling their senators and congressmen, please, please compromise with Obama. On which planet? This whole thing's a goddamn joke, okay? Now here's Jay Carney also adding uh, to this. He says, it, summarizing what he believes are the views of the American people, they just want things done. It requires compromise, and the president has demonstrated his ability to compromise. Well, finally, we have something that is true. The president has definitely shown his ability to compromise. <laughs> okay. Now, how do you think we're going to wind up at the end of all of this? You think we're going to be on the winning end of this super committee? after uh, President Obama's fresh new plans and his uh, call to the Republicans to do more compromise like he is? <laughs> we got a major screwing coming our way, man. Anybody who tells you differently is either lying to you or doesn't understand what's actually going on in Washington. All right, now, there's a story out about how, uh, let me give you the final uh, portion of all this. Story out in, um, about how uh, one of the staffers who works for Organizing for America, which is Obama's campaign group, sent out an email uh, criticizing Paul Krugman and, and the lefty uh, firebagger blogosphere, right? And it's, some people are making a big to-do about this. I don't think it's that important, simply because it's not even that guy writing it. He copied and pasted some but other blog telling everybody this is really important, read it, et cetera. So uh, you can't go three degrees of separation and, uh, and pin it on Obama, no. Okay, but it does give you a sense of the uh, frame of mind, right? So here's a guy working for Obama who sends out this email that sounds like it's like a Republican wrote it, okay? I don't mean the substance where he tax progressives, et cetera. Like I said, I don't care about that, okay? But when you read the details of this, the blog that they copied and pasted, it's like, oh, how could Democrats not understand we have to do spending cuts? It's so important for the economy. And of course we need to do more tax cuts. That only stimulates the economy. I'm like, wh who wrote this, a Democrat or a Republican? Their frame of mind is horrible, man. The minute they agree to all those compromises, they got to defend it to the hilt. Okay, which get, leads us to the next set of points. Um, as... Uh, President Obama is asking for compromise, 
Uh, one of the things that he is uh, going to introduce, along with those tax cuts for the rich, et cetera, is a new jobs agency, which would help uh, with infrastructure. That's great. That's a good, positive thing, and it's important that you know that. Rick Perry, uh, on the other hand, uh, would like to counterattack. Quote, Mr. President, we have tried two and a half years ago of government creating jobs. It's time to let the private sector get to work. Americans need work, not symbolism. Now, why do I give you this quote? Because... As Obama compromised with the Republicans on everything and gave us this so-called stimulus that was actually a third tax cut, that was half of what the prog uh, progressive economists thought was necessary. And again, I, I, I'm not wedded to the numbers, and I, and I think that that's not a big argument I, guess I use against President Obama. But that's how we started. That was, the, that, that was his strong move out of the gate, right? And then it just got weaker and weaker and weaker. And now we're agreeing to almost 100% of what the Republicans want. But does that appease the Republicans? No. The reason I gave you this quote is because at the end, they go, oh, we tried in your stupid liberal ways. We tried more and more government. Well, now it's time to go in the opposite direction. But wait, <laughs> you think President Obama's gonna get credit for the, from the Republicans for actually going 100% in their direction? No, of course not. What they're gonna say is, see, that was the liberal approach. Now we need to try the opposite approach, which is massively right wing. Look, you got to keep asking the question, does Obama understand, not understand this, which is really sad, or does he understand it, which might be sadder? All right. Uh, now, again, Perry, man, and I give you these next set of quotes because every article I read, Perry is punching and punching hard. Obama's equivocating. I've got another quote on that for you in a second, while Perry's punching the daylights out of him. Uh, quote, his approach is to study things. He's referring to the president, obviously. We know what the problem is. We're being overtaxed, overregulated, and overlitigated. And then uh, he went on to say that uh, he wants to restore military respect for the commander in chief, saying basically the military does not respect Obama, and that you got to have somebody uh, coming in. That so he's throwing roundhouse punches, right? He's going after him on every single issue, and he doesn't care if he breaks a couple of plates along the way. And uh, Every article describes him as swaggering, which is true. He's absolutely swaggering. So how does President Obama respond? Let me quote here from the New York Times. Mr. Obama acknowledged that the economy continues to sputter, but he blamed bad luck compounded by political dysfunction in Washington. Show wang, wang, wang. Man, you got a guy going around the country saying, oh, golly gee Willer, because I had bad luck. I, I gave the Republicans everything. I compromised on everything. Why won't they compromise back? Oh, we've got political dysfunction in Washington, which I'm the head of as the president. I don't know. And otherwise, coming by going, bam, you can't. Nobody in the military respects you. We're overtaxed. We got too much litigation. You slowed down the government. You ruined our economy. Now, which side's going to win? Come on, man. Which side's going to win? You know which side's gonna win. Bad luck and political dysfunction. And look, you do, you gotta create jobs. What's wrong with you? So now there's a jobs agency. So you think, as I told you, hey, give them credit, at least we're gonna do something like that in infrastructure bank, bank et cetera. You wanna hear what some of the specific proposals are? Initiatives to help lift rural areas, like doubling government investment in small businesses, and increasing job search and training programs for people in rural areas. Look, it ain't bad. Fine. Am I going to take it? I'm going to take it. And it, if he actually gets a pass, it'll be one of his bigger wins. But it's small bore, man. It's not going to get the job done. A job training program in farms and wherever is not going to get you the million, two million, three million jobs you need. And then, of course, what they will always tell us is what they always say is that, oh, no, but you don't understand what the Republicans in charge, you can't do anything. Losers, losers. That, okay, I'm gonna say it one more time because apparently you didn't hear me. <laughs> okay, listen. You come out and you say I am creating a government program. Yeah, you heard me right. A government program that will build infrastructure in this country, so we can invest, so that it will help all small businesses, and we are going to create four million jobs. Now you get in my way and say, no, don't create the four million jobs. Don't hire four million new people. Go ahead, Rick Perry, get in front of that train. Let me see you do it, Mr. Swagger, okay? Go ahead, look, I, 
And you can always follow me on Twitter. And I do. So get out there and tell me how you don't want to create 4 million jobs. You always say, oh, it's a big government program. It's wasteful spending, et cetera. Oh, boo hoo. All right, look, you reelect Obama, you've got 4 million new jobs in America. You elect Perry and you don't. How's that for swagger? Right? But they're not going to do it. Again, I don't know if it's because they're scared. They're like, oh, no, but they'll say it's government spending. I can't do it. Can we help a little job training program in rural areas? Is that good enough? Is that good enough? And then you'll, they'll do that, and then they'll say, oh, we tried your big government programs. You went all liberal and socialist on us, and it didn't work. Obviously, the right plan is to hit the middle class again and give another tax break to the rich. So that's the way we're going to have to go. There is another way. They just don't want to do it. All right, when we come back, uh, Latinos and African Americans have ap apparently had enough, and the right wing goes after Warren Buffett again because apparently he's not enough of a capitalist. Young Turks. All right, back on the Young Turks. First ever getting questions from Facebook and answering a thingamabobber that we're doing. Yeah. This is kind of like the chupacabra of TYT segments. It's never been seen before. What's going to happen? Oh my God, we answer questions from the audience. Uh, all right, by the way, of course, after this, we will be doing a post game for the members. And one of the stories that we're going to do is Herman Cain believes Obama should be impeached. Uh, that's going to be fun for everybody. Why? Why is he doing that? Number two, uh, a hero uh, in America. That guy who, you know, oh, yes. oh, I love that story. So we're going to do that. And two guys that I did not suspect might run for president might actually do it. Let me thank members real quick before we do the Facebook questions. Uh, I'm going old school again. Alan Christensen is member number 157. Alan, God bless your heart. And then uh, let's go with Nick Mazur, if I'm saying that right, member number 226. He joined up on October 2nd of 2007. Alan joined up on July 11th of 2007. So you guys are awesome for staying with us for all those years. Love you to death. Uh, now, so let's answer your questions. Now, here's how we're going to do it. Um, I have a, a set of uh, randomly selected questions, which I will then further randomly select. Mm -hmm, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, Casper has done more homework than I have, and she will answer questions that she thought were interesting, mm -hmm. and we'll take turns. So, here I go. G-H-A-O, that's not related to you, Steve, is it? O, O-H. Actually, all O's are related. Oh, is that right? That's, that's correct. Okay. So, G, hey, apparently somebody uh, that Steve the audio guy knows. Uh, <laughs> if you had to describe Michelle Bachman in three words, what would it be? Oh, Jesus, Lord mercy. Okay. Clown, dangerous, irresponsible. The gentleman is wrong. Oh, oh wrong. <laughs> 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 that's what happens when you play random sound clips. <laughs> okay. All right. I don't know. I hope I did it. Next. All right. Uh, Mark Sprang asks, why does the public remain so woefully uninformed about candidates and important issues? Is it willful, willful ignorance, or as John Stewart put it, the average people simply are too busy making ends meet to commit the time necessary? I think so. I think that people are too wrapped up in their own economic situation, in you know their own lives and what's happening with their own pocketbooks, that it's really hard. You need time and resources to get involved in the political spectrum. We have the luxury of that. That's what we do for a living. So. Oh, I'm going to go on a huge rant here. Okay, first to answer, the mm -hmm. follow up on the question. Uh, look, nobody told. So, like, yeah, that's another. Part you know of what it. I'm saying? Like, the Democrats uh, and Republicans are in cahoots in uh, so many different ways, as we say all the time on the show. So, how do they know not to get outraged? Like Matt Taibbi did that Rolling Stone piece, where he's like, "Why aren't people t p pissed about the corporate tax holiday, where these corporations are going to rob us of like hundreds of billions of dollars?" Because, Matt, no one knows. We cover it here. Matt writes about it on Rolling Stone. Every once in a while, John Stewart will do a great segment on The Daily Show, and we're done. And okay? most people don't know that the mainstream media is biased. They have no idea. They think that they're being informed by turning on Fox News or CNN or MSNBC. They think that that's it, like that you'll get all the information you need there. Look, none of those major networks did the story that we did about the women who gave birth to stillborn babies in Mississippi, and then they got prosecuted for it. Okay. Yeah, yeah. No one covered that story. I dare you to find me a video clip of any of the major networks talking about that. They don't. So people are so uninformed and misinformed. Yeah. And look, uh, the corporate tax holiday, since both sides are in favor of it, of giving away all that money, the mainstream media doesn't know how to deal with it because their formula, nine out of ten times, is 
Well, what did the Democrats say and what did the Republicans say? Well, if they are in conflict, great, let's do soap operas on television about mm -hmm. that, right? If they're not in conflict, then we don't cover the story. Like, we would actually do an investigation and find out both sides are wrong? <laughs> it's unheard of, unheard of. All right, now let me do my rant. But, oh, Before go ahead. Before that, yeah. Because it was similar, Anna, we, I don't know if we got to the story on TYTU, mm -hmm. reached 10,000 uh, subscribers. Um, yeah! Know, <laughs> but there was a story about why young people don't get out up in arms and protest and are active as much because of things. And it was like 10, 15 things. I forget how many things. It was yes. plenty of things. But one that, that I think is left off of all these lists, and it covers them all, is Americans have been convinced and told over and over again it's un-American to do things like that. You can't do anything against what the government's doing. You can't do anything against what your elected officials are doing because that's an American. It's unpatriotic, You un can't be an American. Right? If you, and if you're unpatriotic, like America, in our minds, we're the most patriotic people in the world. And if you, if you say anything against it, how dare you? And we've been, which is ironically opposite of what Americanism is. Right. No, it's, it's summarized in the, in the cliche of support the troops, right? But wait a minute. I, as an American, as you say, I'm doing the most American thing possible, dissenting from the government that we shouldn't go into Iraq so those troops don't die, right? Mm -hmm. Like, support the troops. You're unpatriotic. Right. And look, and how did that come to be? It came to be when people like Phil Donahue and Ashley Banfield got fired if they, you know, said you, they were going to put a dissenting voice on there saying we don't want to go to the Iraq war. We think it's a bad idea. They got removed from the corporate media. Right. And then all we're left with is the idea that support the troops is the American and patriotic thing to do. Right, and look, we have an entire system set up at this point that discourages people from being politically active. You know, I love that you mentioned that article, which is on Alternet, by the way, and it lists the eight different ways that people are intimidated or discouraged from being politically active. And one of the main things is surveillance, right? You have police enforcement using surveillance taking surveillance and using it against people who are politically active, which is kind of what we talked about with the BART story, right? Th this form of surveillance is social media. They're looking at social media, they're looking at how people are getting mobilized, and they're trying to squash that. So there are a lot of reasons why people aren't politically active. It could be because of the lack of resources. It could be because of intimidation and discouragement. There's so many different reasons. and it's. I, I don't think people even, I think a great majority doesn't even get the intimidation. Mm -hmm. Like they're not even active enough to get to, but uh, like people who watch our show are much more likely to be in that category. Right. But anyway, uh, so here's my rant. So That wasn't your rant. No, 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 no. It has nothing to do with this. Okay, but it's related to one thing you said. Like, so people don't know the things that I know because they don't do my job. I don't expect them to know, you know, what's going to be in the grand bargain and what the super committee is going to decide and what Max Balk, the fact that Max Balk is chief of staff used to be Jim Messina, who now works for the White House, and that's why the fix is in. How the hell would you know that, right? I mean, a lot of people who watch the show are really politically active, so some of you might know it, but 99% of the people aren't going to know. But nobody else makes the assumption in other fields. So, for example, today I have a problem on my computer, right? And I call a guy, and he's like, well, obviously you would do that, and then this, and then this, and then that. How do you not know that? Because, motherfucker, I'm not a technical uh, expert. It's going to be okay, Jane. No, it's but do you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. like, everybody's like, oh, it's so simple. And then your car breaks down, and, you know, the mechanic's always, like, snickering. You're like, oh, well, obviously that's the carburetor. Well, motherfucker, I didn't study carburetors. Look at, look at Mr. Okay. Bitterman man over here. No, but do you see what I'm saying? It's, I know, I know. It's going to be okay. So next time I'm going to go into the carburetor, dude, and be like, Oh, you don't know who's on the super committee? <laughs> okay, you see what I'm saying? Not everybody's an expert in every field or in your field. And everybody always makes that assumption. It drives me crazy. I love that rant. It was hilarious. Yeah, there was, look, I had gone on a similar rant like many years ago when look. some lady at the post office was like, oh, you don't know that the first class mail is blah, 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 blah. I'm like, yeah, because I haven't worked at the post office for fucking 20 years. Look, I, I, look I, I feel you, okay? A perfect example that applies to me is when people give me crap for not knowing sports references. Yeah. I don't, I don't watch sports, okay? I, I don't give a shit about sports. So I'm not an expert, and I don't care. And don't make fun of me for it. No, yeah? I was almost going to use that example. Like, mm -hmm. I was going to say, Anna, when does a, where does a tackle go when he pulls? I don't even know what it means to pull. <laughs> okay, but why would you know? Because you don't give a shit about sports. Right. All right, anyway. Now, time for a second random question. Chance Sprague. Cenk, how old were you when you first started getting into politics? When you were in law school, were you a conservative? Excellent questions, Chance. Okay, one, when I was into politics, immediately. I remember uh, 
crying watching Martin Luther King speeches when I was 10 years old. Aww. Okay. <laughs> no, but I was, I was moved, and I was like, wow, that's amazing, and et cetera. So for whatever reason, I wasn't into carburetors, mm -hmm. right? I was into that, and I loved policy. And, and so, like, the debates, the issues, the ideas, I was always into. The politics of, like, the, you know, you know Mondale or Reagan, whatever, et cetera, well, that had to wait to all the way to eighth grade, probably. <laughs> okay, and I remember Mr. Rollins' class, civics class, and how I would have the debates with him. And he was he was a lib, he was a no good lib, and I was a Reagan kid. Mm -hmm. I was 14 years old. I was like, I know Ronald Reagan's for freedom fighters. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's the answer to the first question. Second question is, in law school, I was definitely a conservative. And I had run into people, friends from law school now, I ran into one in the streets of New York a couple months ago. He's like, Jen K, what are you doing? It's like, what happened to you, man? You lived out. <laughs> and they're all like shocked by it. But again, because I'm obsessed with this topic, I haven't moved, the, con the Washington has moved. And I'd be like, okay, look, let's go topic by topic. This, I still believe that. This, I still believe that. Right. They're like, oh yeah, yeah, I guess. But I'm like, what happened to the country? It went way to the right of me, right? They're like, oh yeah, yeah, I guess. Now, I, I have these conversations with people who care. Don't get me wrong, I'm not seeing a guy from law school, but hey, let me tell you about the political spectrum. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you about carburetors. <laughs> okay. And it's interesting because I just, there's another guy that I know who was, uh, two other guys that I know were conservatives, conservatives back then, right? Um, and one of them I had this conversation with, and he actually runs a major company now. Mm -hmm. It's amazing what happens to these kids. Anyway, uh, and he's like, no, uh, he's like, no, I'm, I'm generally with you. He's like, I'm probably still a little right of you, but he's like, now, I, yeah, compared to, like, we were the two most conservative guys, and he's like, now I, I, people are calling me liberal, you know? Right. <laughs> Given where I am today, right? And, and credit to him for recognizing that, even though it's not his field. Anyway, the other guy, <laughs> he apparently uh, uh, started becoming a swinger. Oh, nice. <laughs> Did he give you a proposition? <laughs> no, 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 no. Okay, and and apparently became a total like flaming liberal. Nice. <laughs> so, yes. Can you tell the audience about what your position used to be on flag burning? Yeah, I see. This guy and fucking Kohler up my ass all day long. Okay, <laughs> that didn't sound right either. Okay. <laughs> well, because we were just talking about flag burning on the show and how flag burning is constitutional. That's a position that I was wrong on. Look, I, you could name it several. You know, I always say I changed on death penalty. On, but flag burning, I don't even know if that made it to law school. It was definitely during, at, during and after college, because after college is when we had those big debates about flag burning. So, uh, you know, I'm very patriotic. Everybody knows that, right? Oh, absolutely. Okay, and so, no, but I am. I'm like goofy no, patriotic, you are, you are, you are. right? Okay. So that's why like when people burn the American flag, I was like, how dare they? Like maybe my favorite song is "Coming to America," <laughs> but my outrage and the reason. But Steve, you remember my main argument was that it was action and not speech. And Jank was the original Tea Party. <laughs> <laughs> That's not true at all. The okay. flag is America. When you desecrate the flag, you desecrate America. When you burn the flag, you're burning America. That's treason, and you should be executed for it. I never said any of that. <laughs> okay, I didn't say that. By the way, Mr. Speech is not just speech, so I guess you agree with Citizens United, where then they said money is speech. Ah! Okay. <laughs> All right, anyway. Uh, so, for example, uh, I, I still believe that uh, Roe versus Wade was judicial activism. Right now, I think that conservatives uh, are massively judicial activists. Now, Citizens United was judicial activism. Uh, I can point to X number of cases, half a dozen cases that are massively judicially active mm -hmm. on the conservative side. And then I realized as time went on, and, and I started to realize this definitely through law school that Scalia was full of shit. That was my first like, oh wait a minute, this guy's supposed to be the big principled guy but he's flip-flopping all over the place on states' rights, whatever else, mm -hmm. based on whatever is convenient, right? But to me, the trimesters are not in the Constitution. They're just not. And I, you know, I'll have that debate till the end of time. They're not in the Constitution. It's, it's too much to say, okay, in the first trimester you can do this, 
according to the Constitution. Mm -hmm. I've always said, and I said back then, that Roe versus Wade was great legislation. The problem was it wasn't legislation. It was a Supreme Court decision. It mm -hmm. should have been legislation. Okay, so that's an example of the many things, and and so and I always tell you I'm I'm more judicially conservative than than you know than even certainly than Obama's nominees, etc. Mm -hmm. The one thing that I'm dead set on is that money is not speech and corporations are not people. But that's like that's the original mother load of judicial activism mm -hmm. when our founding fathers were scared to death of the influence of money and the banks, etc. Right. And when they say freedom of speech, they meant for human beings. They said we are endowed by our creator with inalienable rights in the Declaration of Independence. They didn't say we, our corporations are endowed. It said they were scared of big business. So for the Supreme Court to say, oh, no, 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 uh, the founding fathers in the Constitution meant that we should protect corporations' right to buy politicians, that's such bullshit. Mm -hmm. And it's not at all conservative. It's ridiculous. All right, so you get a sense of it. Next question. All right, I thought we would do a fun question. So um, Catherine asks, if you had a million dollars, would you buy one million little things or one big thing? So I thought this would be fun for both of us to answer. I would use 500000 to buy a house. The other 500000 would be in my savings account, gaining interest. Uh, first of all, A, that is the boringest answer in the history of mankind. I thought this was supposed to be a fun question. Second of all, you're not allowed to split it, so what are you going to do, get a million dollar house? Probably. That's Anna's it. definition of a fun question and a fun answer. <laughs> 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 I really want to buy a house, though. I'd buy... How fun! <laughs> no, no, but at least it's better than, okay, I'll put it all in the bank. That's not even an answer. You're not buying anything. I'm putting, first of all, I'm putting 500000 half of it, in a bank. Oh, wow. Ooh, don't okay, go crazy, okay. Casper. Look, I'll, I'll be specific, and I'll specifically answer her question. She says, would I buy one big thing, or would I buy a bunch of little things? I would buy one big thing. I wouldn't buy a bunch of little things because a bunch of little things indicates like a car, which depreciates in value. Like, I would be super... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. How <laughs> practical is she? It's annoying. Okay. Uh, I would buy one million chicken McNuggets. Actually, for 99 cents, you can get what, like, can't you get... You get six for a nine... No, you get four for 99 cents right now. That's four million chicken McNuggets. What are you going to do? <laughs> You're never going to run out. Chicken okay. McNuggets are tasty. No, I'm kidding. Of course I wouldn't get that. Uh, no, I would probably get a, a, a big ticket item. Well, first of all, I would put it in stock options so I could double or triple it. See, that's what I'm saying, uh, Okay, though. no, no, and then buy something really big. Okay. Now, look, the first thing I want to buy is a car, because the fucking car wouldn't start again this morning, hence my carburetor rent. Mm -hmm. Okay. It wasn't the carburetor, but it's a funny word. Carburetor is a funny word. So, I need a new car. I'm dying. So, mm -hmm. But you can't do that, because it's not a small thing or a large enough for a million. And I'm afraid that you get, you know, a million pieces of bubble gum, and then you go, oh, shit, where'd the money go? So, you got to go big ticket, you know, whatever is awesome for a million dollars. I guess a house. Right. You see? See, but in the end. But what do I do? I don't know, go around the no, world? Here's, okay. mm -hmm. can, I, can I buy like a house, but have like, I don't know, $100,000 left over? And no. Then, and then use $100,000 for things that I really want to do but can't do because I... I just can't afford it. Like, I've always wanted to go to that Four Seasons buffet that you talked about. Oh, yeah, I yeah, think yeah, about yeah. it sometimes. Yeah, <laughs> I want to try it out. Um, well, if you let me, this, that's a good point. If you let me, like, I would, if you said you can use this money to buy whatever food, whatever meal you wanted mm -hmm. the rest of your life, I'd take that over the house. Really? Yeah, because I just walk into, like, whatever restaurant, and I love all these restaurants. I'm like, what now? Oh, That's true. Go. That does sound awesome. That does <laughs> okay, sound yeah, awesome. Okay, yeah. Like, uh, I got my million dollars from. Was it Chance? No, who was it? Uh, Catherine. <laughs> yeah, Catherine gave me the million dollars. Using it here. Where's my buffet? <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Anyway, these guys are very disgruntled with our answers, except I don't know what you guys would I, You know what? I'm actually dying to know what, like, Steve would say about yeah, this. Yeah, Steve, Mr. Krabby Pants over there. I know, well, okay, he has Mr. Krabby Audio Pants. Guy. What would you spend the million bucks on? <laughs> Outsource porn? <laughs> <laughs> No, I would uh, use it as a camp campaign contribution <laughs> yeah. to get Ron Paul elected. <laughs> well, look, two things on that. One, using it as a campaign contribution is very smart because that's your best way of doubling your money. Or much more, you get best return. Stock options, what am I, crazy? That's the best return on investment. Give it to Rick Perry. He'll give you $10 million, $100 million back. 
<laughs> right? Now, if you give it to Ron Paul, uh, okay, it's not, that's not the best guy to give it to. But you know why? Because I'm now coming back around, and this is kind of a bloop, bloop, bloop. I'm thinking, why are I supporting Ron Paul? Why? Why? Like, you know, maybe I should. Mm -hmm. no, like, that thought occurred to me today. Like, so, now I know the answer to that. The answer is because he's 50% mental, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, and I can't have a guy who doesn't believe in interest as the president. And he's pretty much there, right? And now, like, if he actually implemented the things that he wants, it would blow up the economy maybe even worse than Bernanke, in my opinion, right? But he's actually a candidate, I agree with, 50% of the time, which is almost like, a hundred times more than any other candidate, including Obama. Mm -hmm. Like, he would he would actually get us out of Afghanistan and Iraq. And you know what? He might be able to get that done. He's not going to be able to take away credit from the whole country. Right. So, like, his kooky ideas... Wouldn't even, you know... It wouldn't, wouldn't work, work, but he might really bust the, you know, the Fed in a, in a way that we can actually find out what they're doing and stop some of what they're doing, get out of the wars, legalize drugs. And then I started to think, maybe... You know what I'm saying? I'm not advocating all of his ideas, but it's, then I was like, uh, uh, mm, mm, mm. But with the way our current system is set up right now, wouldn't you argue that, you know, corporate interests would buy him out? No, I mean, look, you, it's, a, it's a mixed bag with Ron Paul, because, mm -hmm. for example, Ron Paul, uh, I'm sorry I brought up Ron Paul. You guys are making this conversation boring again. All right, okay, a right. million dollars, okay? Uh, I would actually buy a bunch of, bunch of little things, because, Sadly enough, a million dollars doesn't get you that much in LA. A house? You can't get a nice house for a million dollars. My house is worth You're more than a million. You're ridiculous. You can get a nice house. My for house, I just got it appraised, is 1.25. It's look not at, that great. Look at Mr. It's fancy whatever, pants. Okay? I know. Look at what crabby yeah. pants turn into fancy pants. No, so <laughs> I would take the million dollars and just do fun shit with it. You know, I would buy a bunch of not like tiny one dollar things, but a bunch of five thousand here, twenty six thousand there, eighteen thousand here, and I'll throw a party for TYT to start. How's that? Yeah. Oh, okay. Now you see that's a politician. All of a sudden, he rallied all of us when we were uh, about to call him an elitist. By the way, how did the audio guy get all that money? I don't know. <laughs> okay. Last thing on Ron Paul. I'm not gonna let it go. Uh, <laughs> damn it! You made me forget it. <laughs> um. Oh, oh, on oil subsidies, just real quick. Uh, he's in favor of the oil subsidies. Mm -hmm. And it drives me crazy. So, like, is he doing that because he's going to benefit from that? He's from Texas. That's what he's I'm He's going to get contributions. Now, his, he says he's principled because he's for 0% taxes on oil companies anyway. Mm -hmm. So he's like, oh, give them subsidies. Yeah, take away all their taxes. You see what I'm saying? That's why, like, the 50% of Ron Paul that's mental is unconscionable. Exactly, right? yes. So, anyway. All right, next question. Oh, what is the origin of Shwang Wang Wang? Kip Doyle asks. Okay? God, I love these questions. I can go do it all day long. All right. Now, Steve, you're going to have to help me uh, remember this. It's because it comes from our group of friends. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think I started it, but I don't even remember what I started it with. Do you remember? I don't remember, but you definitely started it. Yeah. And it just kind of caught on. Yeah. Because it, it's, it's an onomatopoeia. It, it, it sounds exactly like what it's meant to be. Right. Yeah. Which is that it's a it's a disappointment. It's a letdown, right? Mm -hmm. And I think it originally started as wang wang wang, mm -hmm. and went to shwang wang wang, and then every other kind of thing, etc. Right. Right. Um, and it's um, it's like how I do wasiktir. It's actually hasiktir in Turkish. Mm -hmm. And every Turkish person that has seen it goes, Cenk, you know you're saying it wrong. <laughs> right? I'm like, I know because. Wasiktir sounds a little better, mm -hmm. even though hasiktir is pretty good. Uh huh. Yeah. <laughs> so that's kind of how shuang wang. And then how do any of these things j jump into our heads? But yeah, I at some point 20, 25 years ago, I said to one of my friends, "Oh man, that golf or whatever it was, that basketball was shuang wang wang," <laughs> and there it is. And now Debbie Schlussel had to shut down our YouTube channel. Yes. yes. <laughs> that's what it led to. All right, next. Uh, All right, we'll do a couple more, and then we'll wrap up. A couple more. Come like, on. you do one, I'll do one, and that's it. We'll okay. call it a day. Um, Graham Blackwell wanted to ask, do you believe marijuana will be regulated within the next four years? Um, federally regulated, I doubt it in four years, because right now there are too many people making money off of this war on drugs. You have private prisons making the war on, uh, on 
making money off the war on drugs. You have private contractors, police enforcement. So many people are making money off of it. And um, we basically have to take care of that situation before we can even think about legalizing drugs on a federal level. So in four years, do I think that's going to happen? No. On a state-by-state -state basis, do I think people, you know, states are going to legalize medical marijuana and regulate it? Probably. You're seeing that in California. You're seeing it in other states. So that's a good way to look at it until the federal government raids these marijuana clinics. And no, no, it's okay. We have a Democratic president. He promised not to do that. I'm sure he'll <laughs> stick to it. Okay, anyway, great answer. I'm going to leave it at that. Mm -hmm. Let's go with Michael Pine. Rate GOP candidates from worst to least bad for the country. Oh, boy. That's a long question. Okay. Uh, Just go with, like, the top five that we're ignore about. <laughs> Can't go to like Huntsman and shit. <laughs> yeah, no. Well, uh, Huntsman would probably be the best among the Republican candidates. I mean, outside of Ron Paul and the theory I just gave. So basically, you know, a scale for this could be whoever's losing amongst their, uh, who's getting the least amount of support is probably best for the country. Oh, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Except Rick Santor and Newt Gingrich. <laughs> so, like, the worst are Michelle Bachman, Santorum, and Rick Perry, okay? Uh, those guys are all not just stupid and crazy, but dangerous. That, right. Like, dangerous is the main... Like, if Michelle Bachman's president, who would she press the button on? Who knows? You know what I'm saying? Yes. It's so, like, it's such a loose cannon. It scares the, the bejesus out of you, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and Rick Perry, man, that guy is a rare combination of, like, Mitt Romney's sliminess and Michelle Bachman's you know, craziness. Mm -hmm. So I don't want anything to do with that guy, man. So in like in this parade of horribles, I mean, you look at Mitt Romney, you go, yeah, that's the establishment dude who's going to screw us like we've been getting screwed, right? So then I put him in the middle of the pack, you know, with Huntsman and Ron Paul being a little further up. Mm -hmm. So anybody who's like a corporate robot, I guess, is in the middle. Does Jeez. that make sense? That's really depressing. <laughs> I know, isn't it? Like, because you're either going to get the lunatics or you're going to get the corporate robots. Right. <laughs> All right. Uh, I'm actually going to do one last one. Uh, and I don't even quite know the answer, but I thought it was a g great question. Nusheen Ahdud asked, who's the best guest you've had on TYT and the worst? Okay. Can I answer the worst? Sure. It would have to be Orly Tights. Uh, or yes. Tates, or however you say her name. Tights. Uh, the audience was legitimately upset at the fact that we invited her on the show, and oh. I agree with them. She was a nutcase. She's the Andy Dick of politics. She's the Andy Dick of politics. That's a good she'll, comparison. Yeah, I mean, yeah, she'll spit in your eye while you're not looking, <laughs> right? Um, how about uh, General Tata? Oh, that was the best. <laughs> that's the interview that I'll never forget. You know, General Tata is the one that's uh, resegregating the schools in North Carolina. Oh, yes! Yes, 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 yes. We got to invite him back on the show. I really want to. I want you to talk right. to him and call him Tata again. <laughs> so now, are you glad I called him Tata? Yes, I'm very glad. By the way, I'm glad not just because he's a tor terrible guy, but I'm glad because it's just the funniest interview you've ever done, in my opinion. Brigadier just General, retired uh, Anthony Tata. He's also the author of Tata. Road Threat. Uh, General Tata, uh, <laughs> welcome to the Young Turks. Hi, how are you guys doing? It's. Uh, Tata, actually, it's a, one of those good Italian names. So, and, and it's you go by General Tata. I go by Tony. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. And, and by the way, I'd like to go back to the 1950s and resegregate North Carolina. Anyway, <laughs> um, so no, look, we had a lot of great interviews. I, I loved when Lou Dobbs' publicist came into the middle of the interview and went on air and was like, "You got to wrap it up." Uh, I loved the guy who was against global warming. And then Ben busted him and said, like, and the guy's like, oh, some school in Connecticut said something or something. He's like, really? What school? Uh -huh. And the guy's like, I don't know, some school. <laughs> okay. We had, we had a lot of good times. Uh, but as substantively, I actually loved the recent interview that we did with Neil Borofsky, mm -hmm. uh, the TARP inspector, uh, inspector general for TARP. I mean, I, I thought we really went issue by issue, breaking down what exactly is wrong with the financial system, how would you fix it, and how we didn't fix it, and then the ultimate conclusion. I, I thought that was an, you know, if, one of my favorite interviews. So if you're going to check out any interview on finance, I would definitely go to TYT Interviews and check that out uh, for substantive stuff. Um, worst, you know, there's a lot of guys who are dry. I, I hate dry interviews. I mean, I, hate, I think I hate dry interviews more than I hate Orly Taits. 
You see what I'm saying? Another really good interview, I know I'm switching gears a little bit, but was Essie Cup. Uh -huh. Essie Cup talking about uh, killing our religion, how the media is too harsh on Christianity. I love that because it was one of those interviews that ended with her hanging up on you because she couldn't answer any of your questions. She was oh, really? A, yeah, she was such an idiot. You don't remember oh, that? Oh, no, I don't even remember that. No. Oh, so good. Check that out on TYT interviews. SE Cup. I don't even know if we have this on TYT interviews because it's old school. But two of the best interviews were Dick Morris walking out of that radio office. Okay, that was awesome. We're yelling at each other 100 percent of the time. It's uh, you know about the Iraq War. And he just finally, he's like, he gets up and he's like, oh, that's it, I'm leaving. And then Jackie Mason, mm -hmm. uh, who I think might have accused me of being anti Semitic. Uh, it's that old school comedian, Jackie Mason, the guy who looks like a clown. That uh, sounds really familiar. But I know it was before my time. I saw that interview after it, it happened, like probably years afterwards. But right. what, what happened again? No, we got into an argument about the settlements or whatever. I don't even remember, right? Mm -hmm. But his position, unsurprisingly, given that he's a massive right winger, very funny guy, uh, was that if you don't support every single right wing position of the right wing government of Israel, then you're anti-Semitic. Oh, I see. Okay. Mm -hmm. So then he was livid and and then and, and hung up on me or something. He called me a jerk and a schmuck and a, and he said. <laughs> Hold, 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 he said. Because he has a lot of chutzpah. <laughs> because he has a lot of chutzpah. <laughs> okay. All right, anyway, that's good enough answer. All right, uh, we're done. Uh, and um, Oh, the post game. Oh, for God's sake, we have a post game. <laughs> okay, but it is going to be a fun one. All the stories that I promised you earlier. Come right back.